the Mario Kart series is always amongst the best-selling games of whatever consoles they appear on, often outselling games like Smash Bros, Pokemon, and even the main series Mario platformers. With this enormous popularity has come a pervasive opinion that these games are made for casual fans, but only viewing them as party games does a great disservice to the amount of depth, strategy, and skill present within every single race. On top of tirelessly working on controls that feel fine-tuned to near perfection, the development team also has to create great courses to exhibit and bolster those controls. While some people might choose their favorite courses based upon the music or a great visual style, I've always thought that some courses were just more fun to drive on than others. But simply saying a course feels good doesn't really mean all that much, and is incredibly vague and undefined. In this video, I thought I'd deeply explore the game's mechanics and systems to try to answer the question of why some tracks simply feel better than others, and come up with a thesis of sorts as to what makes a great course. Because this series has seen tons of changes, I'm going to focus on 8 Deluxe here. Although the more general principles that I'm outlining can apply to all of the games, as 8 Deluxe controls the best, has the most courses, and is easily my favorite of the series, I'm going to be looking at it exclusively. And because I'm a fun guy, after I explain what good tracks should do, I'm going to apply that knowledge by listing what I consider to be the three best and three worst tracks in the game. I couldn't go too long without complaining. Before delving into track design, it's important to understand every technique available to the player, as the courses need to be designed around the strengths and limitations of the controls. You've got the rocket start, drifting, hopping, mini turbos, super mini turbos, ultra mini turbos, the jump boost, the spin boost, and the drift break. All of these tools are useful in any given race, and the main reason this game feels as good as it does is the visual and audio feedback of these mechanics. The vibrant flames that burst out of your vehicle after every mini turbo, the expressive animations of your character after a successful trick, and the sound of wind rushing past you after a perfect rocket start, makes these techniques not only extrinsically rewarding in that they make you go faster, but intrinsically satisfying as they're just fun to successfully pull off. This perfect blend between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation is best exemplified by drifting. Tightly hugging a wall just to blast off with tremendous speed at exactly the right moment exhibits the same relationship between tension and release that makes other forms of entertainment like music and movies so satisfying. This quick demonstration will showcase what I mean. Drifting also highlights the importance of taking good racing lines. Lines are all about optimizing the amount of space you traverse as well as how quickly you can go through that space. Think about how in 400 meter races, for example, not every racer starts at the same point, as people on the innermost track will naturally have less ground to cover. This can also be easily visualized using the game itself. Even though I'm using the same kart combination, and we've both gotten the same mini turbo boosts, in this clip, the ghost is taking a much tighter line, and as such, it's way ahead of me. But while real drivers have to worry about acceleration and how velocity affects the radius of a turn, drifting is what allows players to maintain their speed all while taking the most efficient line. All of these skills would be useless if the tracks themselves didn't capitalize on them, however. The game is obviously focused on speed, as speed is what determines who wins and loses in a race. A good track will not only utilize all of the game's mechanics that increase speed, but pace them out in an engaging way. If a track is only drifting, or only driving across boosts, or only performing tricks, the mechanics aren't being fully realized as they can't naturally affect one another. For an example of these systems overlapping in an interesting way, take Shy Guy Falls. Right at the end of the track, there's two ramps followed by a sharp turn. It's really easy to get carried away with jump boosts and slam into the wall, as you're carrying too much momentum to perform a clean drift. 
It takes thought and practice to carefully position yourself to clear this section efficiently, or you could just ignore the jump boost outright. These two systems interacting like this creates a difficult and interesting section that can often determine who wins or loses. And because drifting just feels so great to pull off, turns that don't incentivize it feel pretty frustrating to drive over, as it's often just faster to drive straight. While the angle and radius of a good turn isn't universally applicable, as characters, carts, and wheels all come with differing speed, handling, and traction stats, there are some general rules that can be used for any corner. At the very least, a good turn will lead to a 70 to 90 degree directional difference, but for corners with a much larger radius, I'd say that number should probably be at least 120 degrees or so. Anything more shallow than that just doesn't feel good to drive on, as it doesn't fully utilize the game's best mechanic. It's also important to consider that turns don't exist in a vacuum. They'll often lead into other turns that have their own most efficient lines, which could then lead into another. It takes a lot of practice and skill to know when to start your drift, where to implement the drift brake, and when to use your mini turbo for every given turn, which introduces a large skill ceiling for players to reach. Great courses will force the player to think about how the line they take on one turn will affect the line they take on the next, which can also extend to cool shortcuts that require precise positioning and timing to effectively make use of. And in regards to track width, I personally prefer tracks that are narrow as it really kicks up the adrenaline, but generally having enough space for three or so carts to be comfortable next to one another is a good target area. Baby Par from Double Dash is one of the more unique courses the series has ever seen. Instead of three laps, Baby Park has seven, as it's a comically tiny track that's just an oval. Based upon my criteria so far, you might think that this is easily the worst track. It doesn't utilize most of the game's mechanics, the turns don't really lead into each other, there are no exciting shortcuts, and there's no source of challenge for the player. While this is all true, this take completely ignores the absolute chaos and fun that occurs every time you race on it. For a point of contrast, look at the map of Cheap Cheap Beach. It's incredibly clear who's in first and who's in last. Now look at this map of Baby Park, and you'll quickly realize that it's impossible to tell which position any given racer is in. If you're in first, you don't really know who's in second and how close they are, which means that you can never be confident enough to really catch your breath. And because all the racers are so close to one another, first will often have to be aware of incredibly powerful items like the Bullet Bill or Superstar that don't normally affect the frontrunner. Baby Park highlights Mario Kart's, if I had to put a word on it, entropy, which is to say that the chaos and unpredictability of every second of gameplay is a critical component of making the game as enjoyable as it is. The most obvious and impactful mechanic leading to this entropy is the items. At differing positions, players have altered odds to receive items within a certain group, where the items generally get more powerful the further away from first the racer obtaining them is. While more... Uninformed players may chalk a system like this completely down to luck, a more appropriate point of comparison would be a poker game, where luck plays a factor, but great players will make the best possible decisions to give themselves the highest chance of winning. This concept is most easily applied when looking at a player in first place and the coin item. Upon first glance, the item seems worthless. Most players will likely already have 10 coins after the first lap, and they're really looking for an item to protect themselves, but once you understand the properties of the coin, it can actually be incredibly helpful. Because coins can't take up both of your inventory slots, having one is a form of insurance, in that you know with 100% certainty that your next item will be able to protect you. Given the boo item as well, having a coin in your first item slot means that you're not losing the ability to guard against red shells if someone yanks the coin. Knowing these things, instead of getting frustrated and absentmindedly throwing the coin away for no reason, a player can use it as a powerful tool for item manipulation. Items in general also force the player to make a decision in how they're used, the most obvious of which is the red shell, as it's exceptional in both offensive and defensive roles. Seeing a player in first holding onto a red shell will likely make the player in second hesitant to overtake them as a gained lead will most certainly be taken away from them along with three coins, but they also know that throwing their own red shell isn't going to result in a hit. This flexibility and power to manipulate other players is applicable to just about every item. Bombs can be thrown to attack players or destroy incoming shells, the boomerang can similarly both defend and attack, and bullet bills can be used to resist attacks and ram into other players. There's even more decisions to be made with this system. 
like when to trail items or when to use them right before running into another item box. But my main point is that effective item usage requires more knowledge and decision making skills than some people might think. While inexperienced players might just view items as luck, a good player will use their game knowledge to make the best statistical decisions to prevent themselves from being in a bad position. Though, even with all of that knowledge, you're still gonna get screwed. What is Lee doing? <laughs> what? What? Oh, yep, lovely. Love that. And, haha, <laughs> just a red shell right in time. Haha, <laughs> it's so much fun. What? What? Bro, just get over the thing! Just go over it! Ludwig! Lud oh, uh, thanks for the heads up. Oh, yep. Having a, having a lot of fun here, guys. I'm having so much fun. Alright, let's go, Dry Bones. I'm good. What? What even hit me? It's okay, Dry Bones. We just got unlucky right there. We're good. What? Bro, oh. Alright. Um, maybe you can get hit? Alright, we're good. Hold up. See this? What? What do you mean? Truth is, I am Iron Man. All right, let's go, Squid Kid. Squidward. Oh, yeah, there's, there's my items. All right, we still got this. We're still ahead. All right, the fruit here. Let's get the boost. And there's Rachel. All right, we're still good. We're still in first place. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. <gasps> no. <laughs> no. Oh, yep. Of course they. They had to. It's okay. Uh, mushroom right here. We're good. We're good. We got this. Oh, no, no, no. Wah! Waluigi. We got this. Let's go. Oh, yep. Mm, yep. Okay. Okay, mushroom right here. Let's go. Now you may be thinking about how any of this actually relates back to the courses themselves, but it has everything to do with the courses. Take, for example, this section from Sunshine Airport. The fastest line you can take is to just hug the inside of this turn as tightly as possible, but the inclusion of the double item block all the way on the outside of the ramp throws a wrench into this. If you already have an item, then this isn't a noteworthy scenario. You'd wisely settle for the better line, claim an item, and just move on. However, if you don't have an item when you reach this section, then you're faced with a choice. You can stick to the inside of the corner and pray that either you don't pull a coin or the person in second doesn't get a red shell, or you could take a worse line to ensure that you'll have a protective item. Both decisions have drawbacks. Going for the better line increases the risk that you'll get hoed, while going for the double item box might lose you a third of a second. The better option is probably to go for the double items, but in an incredibly tight race, or a scenario in which you're second or third, that might not necessarily be the case. Because these courses weren't designed with the double block in mind, there's only so much the designers can do to create these sorts of decisions. But this principle applies to other mechanics as well, most notably the coins. Coins can similarly be placed in inconvenient spots, forcing the player to make a decision. One of the more obvious examples of this type of decision is right here in Sweet Sweet Canyon. To see the effect that the coins have, look at this quick demonstration. The ghost has 10 coins while I currently have 0. Again, you often have to make a decision between collecting the coins, which might have long term benefits as it slightly increases your top speed, and taking the better route, which is faster in the short term. The presence of other racers that take double item boxes or coins from you also requires a player to constantly be aware of their surroundings and exercise precision and control. The best courses will foster an environment in which such entropy can exist, where every race is dynamic and requires the player to make difficult decisions and apply the game's mechanics in a skillful way. So, to summarize, a great course will use all of the game's mechanics and make them interact with one another in interesting ways. This is because the numerous driving techniques available to the player feel great to perform, and stringing them together often leads to interesting and difficult segments. As races are inherently about going fast, it's important that good tracks incentivize speed through satisfying turns, ramps, boosts, and other mechanics. It's best if these are spaced out well, as to make the track more dynamic and engaging. As a cherry on top, having shortcuts that raise the skill ceiling in entertaining ways gives more depth to a track. 
And finally, Corsa should embrace the game's chaos by presenting the player with difficult and important decisions. Now, with this knowledge, let's look at what I consider to be the best and worst tracks that the game has to offer. If track is only drifting, or only driving across boosts, or only performing tricks, the mechanics aren't being fully realized as they can't naturally affect one another. While I absolutely love the reference to the classic NES game, Excite Bike isn't an enjoyable course for me. Most importantly, its laser focus on jump boosts means that many of the game's other mechanics are sadly disregarded. There are only two turns and the randomized mud spots don't act as enough of a deterrent to force the player to seriously adapt. The course is, essentially, a glorified, longer version of Baby Park, which completely undermines the point of Baby Park. As a result of the track's simplicity, there isn't much of a gap between the best players and decent players, which increases the odds that item luck will completely determine the outcome. The third best course was tough to pin down. While 8's rendition of Rainbow Road has corners that are maybe a little too sharp, and Yoshi Circuit doesn't have much going on besides fun turns, I settled on Dragon Driftway. This track strings together tight turn after tight turn, but what separates this course in particular is that almost every turn is right on the edge of becoming an Ultra Mini Turbo. While other courses will gift players with Ultra Mini Turbos through incredibly wide turns, Driftway requires the player to have the patience and timing to properly earn them which makes boosting off with the pink sparks even more rewarding and tense. Combine that with inconvenient coin placement and boost you get from colliding with other players that affect your lines, Dragon Driftway is a consistently entertaining and engaging course. Maybe a bit of a hot take here, but I consider the second worst track in the game to be Animal Crossing. Similarly to Excite Bike, there isn't much of a skill ceiling with this course, as the different mechanics and turns don't really connect to one another in exhilarating ways. This turn right here is too shallow, that one's too sharp, and the transition from the beach to the stone road towards the end never feels good to drive on. Although I like that the course has different variations for each of the four seasons, and it's a good representation of the Animal Crossing franchise, the winter track is easily the worst one for me, as the slippery terrain makes the already unsatisfying turns feel even less tight. Outside of the little fruit that can be used as mushrooms, this course doesn't really incentivize speed, utilize the game's mechanics well, or excite the player. For a series that was born out of a failed F-Zero sequel, it's fitting that Big Blue is one of the game's best. Big Blue is almost the anti-excite bike, in that this course constantly incentivizes speed by fully utilizing the game's mechanics. As this is a segmented course, the player never really falls into a rhythm, which strengthens this track's emphasis on pure adrenaline and energy. The turns are all pretty tight, with special mention to this section right here, and the second segment with rushing water, and the split road at the end allows players to get Creative. Starting right now, fun time is over! Sherbet Land practically contains nothing that makes Mario Kart 8 the great game that it is. While the icy terrain might seem annoying at first, the track's complete lack of any tight turns on said terrain really means that it doesn't matter. This course is a victim of being way too wide. Like, why would anybody even go out here? The result is that drifting never really has any tension to it, and the lack of verticality and compelling item placement makes this track a bit of a chore to get through. There are some underwater paths for variety, but like... Nah. <laughs> I've put a lot of hours into 8 Deluxe, and this is the one and only course that I consistently don't enjoy driving on, in large part because the core mechanics that make the game so much fun are, unfortunately, sidelined. Without question, I think Ribbon Road is the track that best encapsulates why Mario Kart 8 Deluxe is such an addictive and satisfying game. Tight turns, difficult decisions involving coins, tough shortcuts to take, jump boosts that force the player to carefully consider their momentum, this course, straight up, reads like my thesis on what makes a track great. I don't really have a whole lot to say, 
but contrasting this with Sherbet Land is a fascinating look at how levels or sections in a game are either enhanced or diminished by the game's faithfulness to the core mechanics. Numerous games will throw sections into their campaigns that don't really connect to what the game was designed around, and as such, these moments often feel clunky or frustrating. Think about how many games have terrible vehicle controls as they aren't designed around driving, whereas Mario Kart makes carts and bikes feel amazing to handle. A great Mario Kart track stays faithful to the game's mechanics by encasing and celebrating them, but this principle can really be applied to level design at large. It's also cool to see this series actually teach some people how to drive. Now, who, you might ask? Hey Twitter world, this is yours truly. Back here. No! Stop right where you are. Let's go. What's he doing? Take it easy. Watch out. Yes. Stop the vehicle right now. Woohoo! 